All right, so today we are going to continue talking about file systems and we'll actually look at some on-disk data structures used by an actual file system that some of you guys might actually use. So we'll start to make this more concrete in terms of how file systems actually use disk blocks to implement their data structures and translate, in particular, translate paths to find files and also store file data on disk. All right. Um, all right. So assignment two is due tonight. Um, the are we have extra hours to office hours tonight that will potentially run until midnight. I'm assuming that John will probably leave if everybody leaves, uh, but that seems to be unlikely given the number of people that are uh, up there right now. So, but he'll be here as long as you guys are. At 11:59, we will we will shut down submission for the questions for assignment 0, 1, and 2. Um, just, a, uh, just a reminder for, for people who are, uh, how many people are finished? Yeah, see, this is, but this, isn't, this is not the right crowd to ask. <laughs> should go back to the people that are off at, at office hours right now. Um, so, okay, assignments are, actually, this is a good question. How many people, what, what percentage of your final grade for this class are the assignment two and assignment three implementations worth? No, that's false. The implementations for assignments two and three. Can anyone guess? No, total, between the two of them, yeah. 17%? Implementations. No, that's, that's too high. 10%, about nine, actually. The assignments are 50% of your final grade. Assignment two and assignment three are together. Oh, wait, sorry, actually, 17 is right. Ah, sorry. I can't do math, right? So assignment two and assignment three together are 35% of your final grade. I, I, I reduce this one more time. And the implementations are roughly 50% of that, right? So this should be, sorry, that should be like 17, right? So if you don't do assignment two and assignment three, if you don't do any of the implementations, you still have to do the code reading questions and the design documents, you're losing about 17 percentage points of your total score. So I don't know how you guys feel about that, whether that makes you feel better, if it makes you feel worse. Um, I, wish, <laughs> I wish I could make this number bigger, um, but you guys probably don't. So, um, but, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot that gets wrapped up in that 17 percent, right? I mean, that's, that's what separates the people who are really able to do these assignments well and the people that aren't. Um, but but that's, what, that's the consequences of this. So if you guys are struggling, that's good. If you guys are putting in the time and effort, that's when you're learning something. Um, but just keep, you know, keep a bigger picture on things, especially if you're coming to class, if you're turning in the code reading questions and the designs, if you're doing, the, you know, if you're doing okay on the exams, then, then you're doing okay. Um, and after we see how the assignment twos come in tonight, we will decide how we're gonna go forward with assignment three. Um, and we may have some announcements on Wednesday about, about what we're going to do um, given the state that assignment two has come in. I, I don't, what I don't want is people getting discouraged and giving up and not doing assignment three. Right? That's really not what I want. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going to think about that. <laughs> there, will be, there will be some kind of penalty associated with that, right? But we will think depending on how the assignment twos come in. That's not, that's not unusual, right? I mean, a lot of the work you spend on this class goes into debugging, right? That's, that's, not, that's not new, right? I mean, that's something that's been a part of this class for a long time, right? But, um, but yeah, we're going to see how the assignment twos look, and then we'll make a decision about how to move forward with assignment three. All right, any questions about files? Does anyone care about files at this point? <laughs> oh, hopefully a little bit. Um, yeah. All right. So what, what, who, who remembers, at minimum, what, a, what does a file have to do to be a file? Yeah, Gabriel. Sort of name or identity. Yeah, I need, it needs to reliably store data, and I need to be able to locate it, right? I need to be able to uniquely locate that content, right? So a file consists of some sort of name and content associated with that name, right? What other information might we want to know about files that file systems sell? still might help us uh, store. What else 
Adam, give me one. Yeah, I might want to know, yeah, okay, so I might want to, I might have type-specific attributes, but before I can have type-specific attributes, I need a what? A type, right? What else? Yeah. So the name's part of the basic file stuff, right? I can't have a file without a name, right? Because how would I find it? Um, but permissions are another thing. What else? Yeah. Yeah, usually some timestamps, right, when the file was modified, right? So timestamps, uh, permissions, other file attributes that could be type specific. I talked a little bit about this. Um, why do, why do, pro why does Unix provide an interface for establishing relationships between processes and files? Why do I need open, essentially? Why do I need open and close? Yeah, Gina. So, okay, that's interesting. So, does, if, if two processes open, it, let's put it this way. Does, do the Unix file system semantics guarantee that two processes that are trying to use the same file are going to end up with good results? No, it doesn't. It, it, it makes some guarantees about how their writes will arrive at the file, right, that they won't be interleaved with each other, but it makes no guarantees about how those processes use the file. However, there's a feature of file access that you need open to support, which is what? Yeah. Piping? What's that? Piping? No, not piping. Um, yeah. Exclusive access. Yeah, so I can provide exclusive access uh, to the file, right? So I can say only one process can have this file open, and also in certain cases I can improve performance, right? Um, what were, so what were some of the design goals of our file system? Right, we're going to start talking about file systems today and how they actually accomplish some of these things. But given what the sort of requirements of the file abstraction, what are some of the things that file systems have to be able to do? Yeah. Find file, give them a name. Yeah, you give it a name, right? You call open, and open needs to find that file, right? So I need to be able to efficiently translate file names into contents, right? What else? So I've got the naming property down. What else do I need to be able to do? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. File systems usually end up doing that, right? So, so that's, that's a good point, though. I mean, a, a good file system might be able to be successfully, um, successfully use a variety of underlying storage media, right? So as long as it has some sort of consistent, maybe block-based interface, I can, I can build a file system on top of that. But what else do file systems need to do? I've translated a name, I've found the contents, then what am I going to probably do with the file? I need to allow files to move, right? I need to be able to support rename operations, that's pretty critical. And then I need to allow files to be altered, right? I need actually to allow people to write data into the files to remove data from the files, edit them in a variety of ways, and make sure that all those uh, changes are reliably stored on, on the underlying storage media. Right? Now we start talking about, now these are sort of you know, the minimums that I have to do to be a file system. Right? But file systems just don't want to be file systems. Right? They want to be awesome file systems. Right? <laughs> so what do I do to try to be an awesome file system? Right? What would be some things that, if you were comparing file systems, you might look for? Yeah. When it in the well, I don't really care whether a file system does that. What do I care about it that doing that might help? Yeah, Kevin. Uh, you want it to keep your data relatively safe to the long run, but you don't want to just lose everything in case of like Okay, so surviving failures is one thing. Durability, right? How durable is the file system? What sort of guarantees does it give me about what data ends up on disk, right? What else? Yeah. You want the file system to be dynamic? Meaning what? Like, if you're going to file the so it's actually the better memory Okay, yeah, so we'll talk about that. that. That's sort of up in number two, right? Yeah, I don't want it to waste a lot of space, right? I mean, a file system that essentially allowed me to grow and shrink files by just throwing away data blocks would not be so, so good. Right? Um, yeah? Being able to handle like, a, large amount, or a large amount of small files or a small amount of large files, right? So 
OK, so we're getting at something here, both that answer and the locality answer. What do I care about? I, I found the, the file, now what? Latency. OK, latency. We're getting closer to the top of the. Uh, crash recovery. Okay, we, we did crash recovery. We have that one checked off. There's one word. Performance. Performance. There we go. Yeah, so all the, a lot of the, whoa, hello. There's always one thing I forget to do. All right. Um, yeah, so for, that's good. this chair is out to get me. Move it somewhere else. Um, so, right, I mean, I don't know what this stuff is up here. What is this bench for? I should just start doing like, uh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what this is here for. Because it's sort of this like outdoor feeling. Um, yeah, so I care about performance, right? I want to be able to, but performance can mean a variety of different things, right? We talked about a couple different aspects of performance. I might care about reads and writes to single files. So if I'm going to read a huge file all at once, I want to make sure that, that that read is fast. But then a lot of file systems also try to play games by looking for related files, right? And optimizing access to groups of files that may be frequently accessed together, right? Um, and then, right, crash recovery. Surviving failures, maintaining a consistent view of the file system and contents. And this also includes uh, quickly recovering, right? So not just being able to survive the failure, but being able to survive the failure without requiring that you rebuild your disk drive for four or five hours, right? Um, all right, so we, we talked about, uh, you know, all these things that file systems have in common. And then, um, so we also pointed out that if you looked at the disk, and we'll start to do this today, right? We'll start to look at the output of some disk inspection tools. That broadly speaking, there are two types of blocks, right? So all the disk knows about is blocks, right? And all these file systems that we're going to study build these different file systems with different properties that largely support the same interface. But what's different is how they use the disk blocks, right? That's really all that's different about these file systems. And broadly speaking, there are two categories of disk block. You have data blocks, which have data in them. And then inodes, which have anything that's not data, right? The, and this essentially, these are used to store file system data structures that are required to perform those tasks that we talked about before, right? Translating names to contents and storing file contents on disk, right? And, you know, essentially it's the on-disk layout that makes file systems distinct, right? And that, you know, that means what kind of data structures has the file system using to solve these problems, right? And then, yeah, the crash recovery. We'll, we'll, we're going to talk about more about the data structures element today and probably next time as well. And then, because, I don't know, file systems in the 70s just didn't, didn't recover from crashes or something. They probably did, but the crash recovery aspect of file systems is something that, that the, more of the interesting work was done a little bit later. So we'll talk about some of the data structures first and then come back to how we do crash recovery. Um, and the reason this is hard, right, is because I'm essentially trying to implement a complex data structure on top of a relatively slow and unreliable device, right? And particularly when I'm making changes, it can potentially require me to alter a lot of different parts of the disk at once, right? So let's walk through, this is a good example, let's walk through our write, right? So we had about five things that need to happen before this write can actually take place, right? Does anyone remember what some of them were? What's one thing? I'm going to perform a write to the file system. What are, what's one thing I need to do? Yeah, I need to find data blocks on disk, right? I've got new data. That new data is going to go somewhere on disk. So I need to find some blocks on the disk that are now going to be used for data, and those blocks need to be marked as being in use, right? So find some empty data blocks. What's, the, what's something else that has to be done? Okay, well, let's say I've done that. That's a good point. So I would have, I had to check the file, and I've allowed the write to complete. Doug, what else? Uh, you have to update the file size. Yeah, I need to update the file size once the write's complete, right? So there's some file metadata that needs to get updated. What else do I need to do? More fundamental thing. Once I have some data blocks, now I need to do what with them? I need to put the data there, right? So I actually have to write the data to disk at some point. But what else do I need to do with these data blocks? Yeah. Pointer to what? Yeah, I need, well, the data's in the data blocks, 
but you're on the right track. What do, where do I need to be able to find the data box from? Yeah, I need to update the. I need to update something about the file so that those data blocks are now associated with the file, right? So I need to associate the box with the file that's being written to, adjust the size, and actually copy the data. And all of this pretty much has to be done synchronously, right? And we talked about what can happen in certain cases if I get halfway done with this process and then the power goes off, right? And there's a variety of different types of corruption that can happen here, right? Um, all right, so any questions about this before we keep going? All right, so, so now we're going to look at some of these on disk data structures, right? And specifically, we're going to look at a couple of things today. One is this path translation aspect. So how do I take paths, which are these human readable names, and translate them? Essentially, what I'm trying to find, what the file systems do is you give them a path, and what they want is a number, right? Remember, these are computers. So the you know, path to foo doesn't really mean much to them, right? What they need to be able to find is, where is the inode for this file, right? And by the inode here, we mean the sort of top level of the data structure that the file system uses to store the data blocks associated with that file, right? Um, and then I need to be able to find those da the data blocks. So there's, a, there's the inode itself contains a data structure, which needs to allow me to locate all of the other data blocks that are associated with the file in an ordered way. Right? Because this is an ordered stream of bytes that is stored on disk. Right? And then we'll talk a little bit about how these inodes get allocated and freed. Right? Both inodes and data blocks. Right? So I'm trying to do this at a somewhat high level, but for fun, we'll look at actual examples from ext4. Right? Because ext4 and a lot of other mo modern file systems give you a bunch of cool tools for sort of poking around and looking at how things work. Right? Um, first, some more terminology. So a, a sector. Um, is the smallest unit that the disk allows to be written uh, historically. I think this has been 256 bytes, right? Um, a block is, a multi is the, lo it's the smallest unit that the file system will actually write, right? So file system data structures are composed of blocks. The block size is a multiple of the sector size, um, but usually blocks are larger than sectors, right? And, and why would, so, so here's an interesting question. Why would file systems want to use these larger blocks rather than smaller sectors? Yeah? It's probably too hard to keep track of if you have all these small pieces. Well, okay, that's a good point, right? So if I used sectors rather than blocks, then some of the data structures associated with the file system would get like eight times bigger, right? But what's another reason, Gabriel? Though these are on disk sectors, right? So, so essentially, disks provide this interface where it's like, give me a sector number and 256 bytes, right? You cannot, disks do not allow you to write, usually to read or write single bytes at a time, right? You have to write things in sectors. Yeah. Yeah, so my, my blocks are going to be composed of eight contiguous sectors, right? So, right, I mean, if I, give the disk a block of sort of contiguous work to do, right? That, that will be helpful. Um, and the other thing that, uh, so yeah, so contiguous writes are good for disk scheduling. It makes it easy to do because all of those sectors are located right next to each other on the disk. So I can give the disk 4K to write. It can find the right spot where the first sector starts and then go bloop, 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 write everything out all at once, right? The other reason is that 4K is the page size, right? And when we start talking about caching and how file systems do caching, you'll realize that there's a very intimate relationship between the memory subsystem and the disk, right? So one of the uses of memory that we have not talked about yet, but is really vital to modern system performance is as a cache for the file system. Right? And all modern file systems use memory to cache disk writes and reads in order to improve performance, right? And then an extent is now, so, we're going sort of smallest to biggest, right? So an extent is now a set of contiguous blocks that is used to hold a portion of a file. And some modern file systems have, dis have started to build uh, in extent sizes that are quite a bit larger than 4K. So again, another question, I mean, why would I want to write file data in even larger chunks? What's the benefit here? Not super mysterious, Kevin. Well, 
So I have the same advantages I have when I went from 256k to 4k, right? But, um, but, the, but the, the, the real reason here is that files are getting bigger, right? If, if, so essentially an extent now becomes the smallest, in certain cases, the smallest uh, amount of space on the disk I can allocate for a one byte file, right? And this isn't strictly true because file systems play some games with how they handle very small files that we'll talk about a couple lectures from now. But in, in general, you can think at some point, once I get a certain amount of data in the file, I essentially have to round up to the next extent size, right? And actually, when you format, how many people have formatted a disk using ext4? Okay, so there's actually a way to set this parameter when you do an ext4 format. And if your disk is going to store a lot of really large files, you actually might want to set the extent size to be larger. Right? This allows the disk to store larger files uh, more efficiently. All right, so now we're, now we're talking about ext4, right? So ext4 inodes, one inode per file, 256 bytes per inode. Okay, so the inode data structure, which again is the top level data structure for the file, contains 256 bytes. And so I can get, let's see here, how did I end up with 16 per block? I think it's one per sector. Um, so essentially the ext4 inodes are allocated in groups, right? Because 4K is the block size that ext4 uses. And so each block on ext4 file system that contains inodes contains a set of inodes, not just one, right? Because the inode size is, is small, right? What the inode contains is it contains the location of the file data blocks, right? Or some information that allows the ext4 to figure out where those data blocks are. We'll talk more about how this works because clearly what's, I mean, I just told you the file, that the inode contains all of the locations and it's 256 bytes. What's the problem with that? Yeah. Well, but this is, essentially this is telling me which blocks on disk hold data for the file. But why do I have to be clever about how I set this up? Mac? What if you have more than 256 bytes worth of blocks that are situated in the file? Yeah, so if I just, I might just have a little array in there, right? And then my files would be limited to like two megabytes or something, right? And you, as a file system user, would be unhappy with that, right? Um, so I have some information that allows me to start reading the data blocks for the file. We'll talk more about how that works later. Uh, the inode contains permissions and a number of different timestamps, right? And I, I, I don't even, the creation time, last access time, last time the file was written to, or the content modification time, the last time the attributes of the file were changed, and then a deletion time. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, why, to, in, in what sense does an inode contain a deletion time? Why, why might that timestamp strike you as a little weird? Yeah. Yeah, because like when I delete a file, don't I delete the inode? Well, I guess it turns out you don't immediately, right? So these inodes are allowed to, to stay around and probably eventually ext4 will reuse them, right? But until they're reused, they still have some information about the, the file's uh, deletion. Um, and like everything, you know, the computers use, inodes are named and, and located by number, right? So here is some output from a cool tool called debugfs. Um, and this is, I don't have to worry too much about this. This is uh, a ext4 file system that's mounted at dev xvda1. This was on an Amazon virtual machine, which is why the device names are a little weird. Um, so I've asked it, I've run this command, stat, and then this is the inode number. Right? So it turns out that on Unix systems, uh, 2 is now the convention for the root inode of the system. Right? I think at one point it was 1. Right? And then maybe, I don't know, we ran out of 1s or something. So we've, we've gone on to 2. Right? Um, so 2, and, and what this is, command is going to do is it's going to print out the content stored in the inode in a pretty format. Right? But all this is doing is it's reading the inode 2 from the ext4 file system and format in the output, so it's nice for us to look at, right? So what does this tell us? This is, it tells us the inode number, which is good. That's the one we asked for. This inode is a directory, which is also good because this is root, right? This is the root uh, of the file system. Uh, it tells us the mode, some flags. I have no idea what, the ver what these generation or version numbers is. User 0, group 0. Who is user 0? 
sudo. Hmm. <laughs> root. <laughs> User's, uh, user zero is root, right? Group zero is usually, I think, wheel. Yeah. What, what is the mode? What is the mode? Good question. What is the, what is the mode of this? What's 0755? I'm going to translate that into Tom. What does this mean? Right? And the group has only read and write. And yep. Others, others have only read and write. Oh, read and write. Hmm. So close. Uh, uh, read, and read and execute, right? And, and it turns out on directories, execute means that you can open the directory and follow it, right? So here, what this means is that the root user, the first, the first, uh, oct the first octal, uh, whatever they're called, octet, nibble, what, I don't know. <laughs> The, the first digit here, these are, these are octal, right? The first digit here has some extra permissions that you don't need to worry about, but are kind of cool if you're curious. Uh, this is the uh, user permissions, group permissions, and permissions for everybody else. Um, so this is, root says, root has all permissions, and these are essentially bit masks, right? So four is read, two is write, and one is execute. Um, it, this tells me the size of this particular <coughs> file, right? Now this is interesting, this is a directory, right? So what, it, what, this is 4K, meaning that there's one block, right? And a lot of times, if you guys look around your file systems, you probably notice that your directories are 4K in size. Has anyone ever seen a directory that's larger than 4K? Yeah, they, the directories are just files. We're gonna look at how the structure of one in a minute. And if you actually end up, if you have a directory with a lot of entries in it, it can get bigger than 4K, right? Directories are just files on ext4, and if the directory gets too large, ext4 will allocate more space for it, right? But a lot of directories are 4K because they don't have enough entries in them to get bigger. Um, and then here are all my creation and modification times. Uh, these are beautiful. I have no idea what the format of these is, but luckily it tells you, right? This tells you, you know, when you created the file system, um, Last time it was modified, you can see that, you know, root is not a part of the system that gets modified often, right? Set up sort of when you format, and then usually you don't add or remove directories there. Um, and then down here, here's, and there's some extra inode fields, and down here this is sort of like the, the good stuff, right? So here are the blocks associated with this file, right? Remember, to some degree, what we cared about here was when we were doing path name translation, was simply figuring out what are the blocks associated with this file. Eventually what we want to do is translate a path name to an inode. So once we get to the inode, we better be able to find the blocks, right? And here we go. This tells me exactly which block 8737 stores the directory contents for the root directory of the system. Does this make sense? Pretty simple. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about how we locate inodes, right? So. Um, the, the first question is, how do you actually get translate an inode number into the contents of that inode? And it turns out that you, know, you have the bootstrapping problem here, and the way this is solved is simple. On ext4, when you format the file system, all the inodes are created. Every inode that the system has is created when the, system, when, when the file system is formatted. And they're all put in sort of well-known locations, right? So this is not quite how it looks, but you can imagine that you put all of the inodes at the very, very beginning of the drive, right? Or very beginning of the partition that you're formatting. And what this means is that it's very simple to translate the inode number to the exact 256 bytes that you're looking for, right? What are the, what are, but there are some interesting consequences of this design decision. What are some of the issues this raises? Yeah. Does it have a number of files instead of maximum number of files? Yeah, there is actually. And, and if you, this has never happened to me, um, but you can run out of inodes on your system. You can, the ext4 system can run out of inodes. What would you have to do in order for, to get this to happen? What, 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 would, what, would a, what would a characteristic of your files have to be? Small and many. You'd have to have a lot of really small files, right? Because if you have a lot of really big files, what happens is you run out of disk space before you run out of inode space, right? 
And I think uh, when you when you for, you can add this is something you can actually override when you format an EXE4 file system. If you had a file system that you knew you were going to put a lot of tiny little files on for some reason, which would be a bad idea maybe in a lot of ways, uh, but let's say you were going to do that anyway, uh, you could tell EXE4 allocate more inodes than normal, right? And I think it, um, well, oh, I'm sorry, oh, was, I gave it away. Uh, but the I think by default EXE4 allocates something like. It has a fixed ratio, so it takes the disk size and it divides by a certain number, which it considers to be sort of the average file size, and then it, it allocates inodes, right? A certain number of inodes for so the inodes grow with the size of the disk, but um, they're all created at format time. So what's the other consequence that I just leaked here about um, about this approach to locating inodes? Where are the inodes? Yeah. OK, so, well, I mean, finding an inode to use for a particular file is still dynamic, right? I still need to do that allocation, but, but I think you're getting at something. Yeah? Well, there's a meaning of the disk. So you always have to go in the disk. Right, so what am I going to do after I find the inode? In most cases, what's the next place I'm going to go? To one of the data blocks, right? That's why I found the inode in the first place, to figure out what data blocks are associated with the stupid file. Now, I've got all the inodes packed in one corner of the disk, and what this means is that my disk is going to constantly be sort of seeking back and forth between where the inodes are and where the data is, right? Um, and it turns out that ext4 has a very simple, like, computer systems, wonderfully simple computer systems approach to this, where they just create a bunch of blocks of inodes, you know? So essentially, they take your big disk and they make it into little disks, right? Little mini disks. That each have a set of inodes and a bunch of data blocks, right? And so, mapping an inode number to an inode now consists of figuring out sort of what group of inodes it's in, which is not hard, and then performing an offset into that. But what this does is it minimizes or reduces, I should say, minimizes, reduces the space between the inode associated with the file and the data blocks, right? And then, right. So there we go. Exe4 creates approximately one inode per per 16 kilobytes of data blocks. And this is pretty small, actually, right? This is a pretty small average file size. And so that's why it's unlikely that you're going to run out of data blocks on your, or inodes on your ext4 file system, is because it's pretty conservative about how many it creates. It creates a lot more than it probably needs. Um, all right, so now let's talk about directories. So directories are essentially just a special file, right? So ext4 uses a very well structured file that maps inode. Sorry, the maps names to inode numbers. Okay, so I am. So you probably never knew that you. Did anyone ever know that you could do this with ls? It's pretty cool. Um, you can get ls to give you um, inode numbers in the directory listing. I don't know why you would find those useful, uh, but ls will tell you what they are, right? So if I do, if I do an ls of the root directory, it tells me that the root directory is inode two, which is what I hoped. Um, but now if I do an ls of the contents of the root directory, I get all of these different files, and here are the inode numbers associated with them, right? Okay. There's a couple of interesting things in here, right? What do you, so somebody has noticed something funny. Yeah. What's number one? There's two number ones. This is not good. <laughs> um, so what are proc and sys? Are proc and sys real file systems? Yeah, so it turns out proc and sys are not real file systems. And, and actually, um, I don't know why they're displaying item number one. Probably, I'm sure there's a good reason for it. But uh, proc and sys actually do not map to inodes, right? They're actually, these are separate mount points. If you ran mount, you'd actually see that proc and sys are mounted separately from the root of the file system. And proc and sys are actually also pseudo file systems. They actually don't uh, consume any space on disk. They're file systems that allow, they, they look like a file system, they smell like a file system, but they're entirely dynamically created by the OS. Um, we talked about that a little bit, a long time ago. Um, and so here's you know, ls in my home directory, and here's the same thing. A couple of names and I know numbers, okay? Um, right, so, so now that we know that you know, the file system names Essentially, are in order to find a block, I need an inode number, and I have these directories which match inode numbers to path names. Now, the thing to notice here too, right, is that mm -hmm. I wish I had a better example. 
These are, this is just the relative path name in this directory, right? All this says is that if you want media, root media, go find out about it at this inode number, right? Media is probably, what do you think media is? Is it a file or directory? It's a directory, right? So you're going to go open this and be like, oh, it's another directory. And inside that directory will be more of these uh, mappings, right? Um, so, sorry, I think I had two of these slides for some reason, right? I don't want to do this yet. Okay, so now we'll go back to that. But, but now let's figure out when, I, when you call open, right? Because what the file system is going to have to do when you give it a path is translate that to an inode number. Right? So who can see how this process works? What's the first step in translating slash Etsy slash default slash keyboard to a inode number? Yeah. So you probably go to inode 2 first. Yeah, so I need, I need a little bit of extra information to bootstrap this process, right? Because until I know an inode number, I can't translate paths. And so that's where this magic inode 2 comes from. 2 is hard-coded to point to root. Right? So I always start at 2. Right? So I get the inode number, and I know that. Right? Now what do I do? So I've got an inode number. What's the next step? Yeah. Right? So I essentially go, I open uh, the directory with inode number 2, right? And now I look for Etsy, right? And let's say that Etsy maps to 393218. What do I do now? I open the directory with inode number 393218, and I look for default, right? And now I find default with inode number 393247. Now what do I do? Now I open, uh, uh, right, so yeah, this gets boring, right? So now I go to this, I look for keyboard, right? And then I find this file. This makes sense? It's pretty simple, right? Um, what do I, how does this differ if I'm using a relative path name? Let's say this had been dot, dot, Etsy, or dot, right? Dot or dot, dot, how, how does that differ? Yeah, yeah, they're kind of files, right? What, what important piece of information does the system need to know in order to translate a relative path name? Yeah, Mac. Yeah, get, you know, get CWD, right? So I need to know what the working directory of the process is. Once I know that, I can build a absolute path name for, uh, for any file on the system, right? even if I have to backtrack a few times, which the file system can clearly do, right? Um, all right, so let's go back and let's look at the super stats, because this is kind of cool. Um, yeah, so we, we just talked about inodes and, and uh, you know, the number of inodes. Here's the inode count. This is the total number of inodes that were created when the file system was initialized. Um, I think there's a, f where is it? Free inodes, yeah, so most of the inodes are still available. Right, tells you the block size, uh, the blocks per group, right? So this is similar to an, uh, oh, sorry. So the groups are, remember I said each, I, I put little pieces of inodes at various points throughout the disk. The number of blocks per group is defined right here, right? So this tells, the, this tells you how ext4 is chunking up the disk, put inodes in places so that they can be close to data blocks. Um, this tells you something about when the file system was last cleaned. This is kind of cool, the lifetime writes to the file system. Why would I care about this? Why, why would a file system track this? Why would this be an interesting parameter? Other than just being cool. Why would I care? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of drives, I mean, writes are, a, are, are a, a pro, an operation that's going to put some wear on the disk. Right? So if I have some idea, this gives me some indication of load. Where? Gabriel. Yeah. This, or, or maybe this actually, maybe this is a feature that was added after Flash. I have no idea. It's very interesting though. Um, this tells me what the inode size is, you know. And, and then here we go. So this goes on for a while, right? If you run this, what it'll point, what it'll show you is each group, right? Because I've created these little mini file systems, 
here's where the block bitmap is. So what would I, what would I use the block bitmap for? What's one thing that I needed to do in order to, to perform a write operation? Where? What's that? Yeah, that's not, so the bitmap is not for that. The inode table is going to be used for that, right? That's the table of the inodes that are actually present on the disk. But what would I use a block bitmap for? What are bitmaps good for in general? Bitmaps are a very efficient data structure for doing what? Oh, man. You guys need to do assignment three. <laughs> for, for marking objects as allocated or deallocated, particularly when I have fixed size objects, right? So the inode bitmap and the block bitmap are both used to mark which blocks in which inodes in this particular group are free, right? If the bit's set, they're in use, right? Um, and then this gives you some uh, data about the, the uh, group. What's interesting here is that this, um, you'll see the group zero has zero free inodes, right? So this group is out of inodes, but it still has a lot of free blocks. And remember, what EST4 is trying to do is it's trying to locate data close to, um, close to the blocks, close to the inodes. So when the group runs out of inodes, if another group is available that still has inodes and data blocks left, EXT4 will put the data there, right? So this group is not full, it still has some data blocks left, but because it's out of inodes, EXT4 has been using another group to store files. Yeah? Does, yeah, okay, good question. When, when do I modify the inode? What are some examples of a time where I would need to modify the inode? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, when I add or remove data blocks, m maybe. That's an interesting question, but probably. Yeah, I probably need to update the size, right? What else? Yeah. When I move the file, yeah, so I, I might need to, well, actually, that's a good, okay. Yeah. Do I necessarily need to modify the inode when I move a file? Yeah. Probably not. I'm not probably not going to touch every inode, but but let's go back to the the question that that earlier answer posed. Do I need to modify the inode to move a file? No. What do I do, what do I need to modify? The directories that the file is stored in, right? So in and, and there might be some information in the inode about where the file is. So I, I don't want to categorically say that the and the answer's not right, but in, th in theory, I should be able to move a file by just deleting it from one directory and adding that name to another directory. Right? It's the same inode, it's in the same place, but I can move it. Yeah? Where does it store the actual strings that make up the files? Where are the strings that, store, that make up the actual file names stored? Yeah. No. No. Yeah. In the directory. Right, the directory data structure is set up so that it can map arbitrary length path. There's probably a, a maximum, right? But arbitrary length strings to inode numbers, right? Yeah, so that data structure, I don't, actually don't know what data structure is used for that, but there's a little bit of complexity to it. Yeah, you have to be able to deal with arbitrary length paths. And you want it to be compact, too, right? I mean, I don't want to allocate enough space for the longest path name I could possibly have in every directory. All right, let's, so we went through this. Okay, so now, so now, so now that we, we've sort of talked about path name translation, does anyone have any, well, we're almost out of time, actually. Does anyone have any questions about path name translation? I think we're going to stop there today. And on Wednesday, we'll talk about modifying data blocks. Yeah? Is there any cache in the inodes or the path directories on in memory? Oh, I would hope, I would hope there would be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We will talk more about caching um, uh, later, but yeah, so you can, and as we're going, you might think, you know, which ones, of, which of these operations are safe to cache and which are not, right? But you can certainly imagine that the root inode, for example, and a bunch of inodes on commonly used subdirectories are probably in memory pretty much the whole time the system is operating, right? They may need to be written out to disk periodically, but there's always a current copy in memory, because you wouldn't want to keep reading that off the disk. I mean, that's just a name, right? So. All right, good luck tonight. Finish up assignment two. See you guys on Wednesday.